Uh, okay, so we will go through the midterm exam questions and their answers today. Uh, and it is an important lecture for you because the grades are not very high and this, this stuff is just not going to vanish. It will also appear in the final exam. Uh, so that's why the solutions that I will provide here uh, are very important. I hope that you uh, can take as much as you can uh, and uh, learn the answers uh, and perform well at least better in the final exam. So we will go through the exam sheet now. Here is the exam that started with uh, true false questions. Uh, the first one should be uh, false. Uh, the barycentric coordinates of a point inside the triangle will add up to one. So that uh, adding up to one is one condition. There is also another condition that all the uh, barycentric coordinates uh, must be positive. So if some of them are negative, then it means that even if the barycentric sum is one, it means that your point is in the plane of that triangle. So uh, remember that a triangle is just a piece of finite piece of an infinite plane. So adding up to one means that, okay, your point is in that infinite plane. Uh, then making the coordinates positive uh, means that your coordinate, uh, your point is not just only on the plane, but also in the region bounded by your triangle. That's why you must uh, look for all positive uh, coordinates. Alpha, beta, gamma, remember that barycentric stuff we used for point inside test. So they must all be positive uh, as well as they must add up to one. So you have to look for two conditions. Here I am just giving one, that's why this should have been false. Uh, the surface of a unisphere can be modeled by a parametric equation with two parameters only. Uh, yes, two parameters are, are enough. Uh, if you recall, you need two angles, alpha, or like alpha and theta. Uh, so with alpha, you can go over the equator and stop at some point. And then with the theta amount, you go vertically upwards or downwards on that uh, equator point. Uh, so theta equal to zero, you will stay at that center uh, equator, that largest circle on the sphere. Uh, but with positive or negative values, you go up and down. So you need just two parameters only uh, to parametrically represent a sphere, uh, a unit sphere. So unit means radius is one. So it is not even a parameter. So if I didn't put unit here, then you would be needing a third parameter to define your radius from the center. A rectangular image cannot be used for texture mapping of a triangle. Uh, false, actually. Uh, an image, we didn't put any constraints on our images. Uh, so it can anything, as long as you map your triangle to 2D, to that UV space, you can borrow the uh, intensities from the corresponding image area. And uh, yeah, so then it can be rectangular, circular, whatever. Yeah, this is false because it can be. Four questions. Uh, the ambient component of uh, spheres illumination is not dependent on the sphere's material. Uh, false again. Uh, so here, so, and the next question is also about that uh, reflectance coefficient. So let's remember this stuff over the uh, slides actually. Uh, so we can, Um, okay, so I will copy this part that are all about images. So I will 
Um, so it doesn't copy, of course. So let's just take a screenshot of this. I will put this to my PowerPoint and we will follow it from the slides. Uh, so let's go to the PowerPoint then. Uh, it is about our ray tracing slides that I can't see here, unfortunately. So where is the... Uh, I download the slides. Now we can look at that. Okay, ray tracing stuff. Uh, Yes, yeah, so actually I am talking about the following. For the ambient stuff, let's look at the big picture first. This is very important in our ray tracer, as you know. Uh, this part covers the ambient shading as well as the diffuse shading. So, uh, but in the end, what this uh, illumination does is it decides how much the base color is reflected. Uh, so the ambient, term will deflect some of it and diffuse term will deflect some of it. In the ambient term, there is no uh, direction. So this is uh, the approximation of the of all the lights coming to your surface from all these bounces. So the light bounces off from one surface to another. So it is very difficult to keep track of that bounces. So we just put this ambient term, uh, which depends on the uh, light intensity, uh, which is usually usually white, uh, but here it also uh, depends on the reflectance coefficient of your material, which we call ambient reflectance coefficient. Usually we pick this color to be the same as the base color. So if your shape is gray, uh, that coefficient will still be uh, 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 so the, that gray will be in this intensity part, uh, but how much it will be reflected. And if, if we come back to the uh, question here, so I think I put that somewhere here. So let's put that in our PowerPoint. Okay, so this is the part. So what? Does the question ask the ambient component of a, of something's illumination is not dependent on the sphere's material false because it is this ka uh, is just material specific. The surface color obtained by texture mapping can be used as uh, an object's reflectance coefficient in ray tracing computations. Yes, it can be used uh, because after all this is CRCGCB the base color. It can be defined over the surface, like everything will be red, but it can also be obtained from a texture. Uh, then this just becomes true. Uh, so the, can, it can be used as objects reflectance coefficient. Uh, and in the specular highlighting, uh, we have this Boolean Fong model. Actually, these are two separate models, Boolean model uh, and Fong model. Uh, so what <clears throat> Boolean does is uh, it looks at this half vector between the your location, I, camera location, and the lights incoming light direction. So the half vector, uh, and you look at essentially the angle between this half vector between E and L and the normal vector. Uh, so if this angle is zero, like if, in other words, if this green thing reflects directly into your eye, then this black part moves upwards. So does this H and they overlap. So the dot product between N and H will be maximum. So you will get the maximum 
uh, light in your eye. Uh, so it's uh, long story short, it depends on this age, which depends on eye view, camera location and light location, as well as the surface normal, because I have this, uh, uh, the surface normal uh, is how I do uh, the angle between H and N. And in, this is the Boolean model. In the Funk model, which is very similar, we just compute this R vector explicitly, uh, which takes uh, more operations than just halving E and L, but still it can be done uh, with some cross dot products. Uh, yeah, uh, and then again, uh, it boils down, down to this angle between R and N, which is, uh, in this case, your I is here and R is here, so you are missing some of the reflectance, so it will not hurt a lot, you will not get a lot of intensity. But if you move your uh, I right here, then you will get the maximum intensity. So if you look at our uh, final equation here, uh, the specular reflection uh, is obtained by the dot product between n and h. Uh, and there's also this p exponent, which is asked in the next question. Uh, but in the end, so this left part is already discussed how much the base color is reflected. And with this addition, I now talk about how the object reflects like specularly. Uh, yeah, so if we come back to the questions here, then this answers the following. Uh, the specular component of the ray tracing illumination model depends on viewer's position and the light position, true. Uh, but it does not depend on the normal, false, because I look at the angle between the normal and the reflected light vector. So normal is definitely included. Uh, Yes, uh, and so eight is related. When we increase the specular exponent shininess, the P exponent, the specular highlight on the sphere gets, gets larger. No, it gets smaller actually, because if we look at the behavior of that, uh, so this, uh, angle between n and r or n and half vector h is actually the cosine. Uh, uh, so the dot product between them is actually the cosine of the angle between them. So th let's look at the cosine behavior. With power one, just cosine, I have this smooth die off uh, effect. As I increase the p, uh, the power of cosine, then it dies off quickly. So it means that the effect will be smaller. So I had a better picture about it here, if I recall, yes. So here P is large, uh, smaller here at the left. Um, so it doesn't really die off at all. As I increase P, it starts to die off and we see that dying from white to base color. And when we have bigger P, we just focus on a smaller region and we have a sudden death. That's why with P bigger, I have smaller, uh, I have smaller highlights, not larger, false. And about number seven, diffuse shading components uh, of a surface point are the same for cameras located at different points through diffuse shading. So let's come back to this model again, how much the base color is reflected using ambient and diffuse components. So here I am asking about the diffuse color reflectance. It depends on the normal as well as the light direction. It doesn't care where you are. There is no eye here. There is no camera here. Uh, it is all about N and L, the angle between N and L. And to be exact, the cosine of the angle between N and L. That's why we take the dot product between these two unit vectors. So it makes seven true then. Uh, so coming back to our 
exam sheet uh, at number nine now. We have a text clear mapping question. The resolution of the text clear, text clear map can be larger than the resolution of the image generated by ray tracing. Yes, it can be larger or even smaller. So this is why we use MIP mapping actually uh, for efficient processing of these resolution differences. So it, it is true. Having a 2D text clear image is one of the requirements of text clear mapping. Uh, false, it is not required. You can generate your own text clear procedurally. Uh, as we discussed in the class, so you can use some sign sinus functions to get some oscillation on your shape. This is a texture also, or even it's not all about colors actually. Texture can represent anything. It can be the, it can be vectors to be added to your normals to get different effects. So you really don't have an image around to perform texture mapping. This is just one application of that. Due to uh, mirror reflections in ray tracing, it is possible to see objects that are behind the camera. So this is interesting, true also. Uh, normally, we are sending the ray from behind the camera towards to the, in front of the camera. So how the hell can I get that ray hit something uh, behind the camera then. So because it's a line, it can't make a rotation or curved behavior. Uh, so here it is about reflection. So let me also show that with a picture we have seen in the class. Uh, so it is in the same slide set actually, if I recall correctly, in the place where we discuss uh, shadow rays, not uh, reflection rays, okay, reflective re reflection rays. So here it is told you that uh, you have a reflective object. We are talking about mirror reflection. So assume that this is like a mirror. So what we do is normally this ray is the primary ray hitting at this location. You can compute this color and this map it back to the image plane if this is not reflective at all. But if this is reflective, then you take this, take normal at this point and reflect this blue line using that normal as the bisector of the angles and generate this uh, black ray, reflection ray, which can go behind this eye. It is not happening here, unfortunately, but you can think of it like this maybe uh, this green thing is also reflective and it is uh, maybe positioned like, like this instead of, so that green triangle is maybe this. Then this primary ray hitting here will, is supposed to collect points from, uh, collect color from this location, but if this red triangles, this if this is also reflective, then you will also make another reflection from here, which goes way back be behind the camera. Then it will also borrow some color from this object that is behind the camera. Uh, and it will be reflected all the way in this image plane location. So you don't have to do two reflections. It can even work with one, but uh, this is what I am asking, like it is true uh, that we can see stuff behind the camera because of reflections, uh, thanks to the secondary rays. Uh, but if I asked, so did I share the same thing? Sorry. Uh, if I asked this question with primary rays only, then it's not, it is not possible. So. Maybe you can expect a twist like that in the final, but uh, so I don't restrict you to a primary race. It is just possible, yes, true. 
The cells in a KD tree can have high aspect ratio. What is an aspect ratio? It is uh, for a rectangular cell, it is the ratio of width and height. Uh, so this is true because remember KD tree, it partitions your space using axis aligned uh, planes in 3D or axis aligned lines in uh, 2D or in any dimension it works, but let's focus on these two well-known dimensions. Uh, but these partitions, they go through the points uh, which will cause uh, non-square regions. It, it will be rectangular because you can't decide how those points are located in the first place. So I am telling this because if I have asked this for quad three, uh, then I have all regular quads, uh, there is no uh, different sized cells. Uh, so if I stop uh, subdividing a quad with a cell because there is no ray intersecting it, then that cell will be bigger than the subdivided cells, but still the aspect ratio, as far as the aspect ratio goes, we still have a good aspect ratio of one because it is just square no matter how you uh, subdivide your cell. In a quad tree, by the way, why am I describing quad tree? Because this is not about quad tree. We, are, we have a KD tree here, which is the different difference, uh, which is different from the quad tree. In KD tree, we can have arbitrary cells, unlike the quad cells of the quad tree. Or octree is the 3D version of the quad tree. Octree is also very, uniform, all the cells are cubic, uh, no rectangular prisms. So we have a constant aspect ratio of one there too. Uh, but for KD3 in any dimension, you can expect high aspect ratio. Huh, okay, so in the next question actually, I have a quad three question. Uh, in a quad three, we have all square cells. Uh, so I, I don't, want to go back to the slides for this, but you can imagine a quad tree, I, I believe. Uh, if not, uh, look at that. Uh, it is, uh, you begin with one big quad, and then you divide it into four smaller equal quads. Uh, and then you take one quad, like the southwest quad, uh, and if your ray intersects that, you subdivide that into four new quads as well. So I always get uh, squares with that process, not cubes. So if I ask this for octree, it would have been true. But with quad three, it is false. Uh, so this is also a tricky question. The, the that, that product of any two vectors gives the cosine of the angle between them. So the any here makes a lot of you fail. Uh, so this is false actually, because uh, the dot, uh, remember the expansion of dot product, a dot b is equal to length of a times length of b times cosine of the angle between them. So if the lengths are one, if the vectors are unit, then length of A and length of B, they are just one, one times one is equal to one. So then this holds the dot product of two unit vectors uh, gives the cosine of the angle between them. But when I tell any two vectors, then you will have a non one or a length that is not equal to one, can be anything more than or less than one, uh, which gives which scales this cosine of the angle uh, with an amount, then you should use false here. Uh, this paper said true, but in parentheses uh, mentioned unit. That's why I didn't cut any points. Uh, but uh, yeah, this should have been false because of the any, these three letters. Uh, if you apply displacement mapping to a sphere, then its shadow will have bumps. Uh, true, because uh, displacement mapping uh, is from a texture 
uh, you read some values uh, in the form of a vector, displacement vector, and you add those vectors to your points. So uh, those directional vectors to your position vectors to get new positions. So you effectively change the positions. Then obviously when you calculate your shadows, uh, your shadow rays will be affected because the positions and normals have been updated. So the shadow will also see those bumps. Actually, inspired from this question in the fill in the blanks here, I talk about bump mapping. And the difference is in the bump mapping, the uh, displacement vector part is the same. So from the text here, we read uh, some displacement, uh, not a color, uh, so a displacement. And we add that displacement to the normal, not to the actual geometry, not to the coordinates. So with the normals updated, uh, you will be seeing bumps in your render of the surface, because as you recall, our diffusion component, as well as the specular highlight component, they all depend on the N normal. Uh, but uh, since the, there is no update on the positions, uh, the shadow will still be intact. It will be smooth. So I expect that answer here actually. Bump mapping displaces the normals only, not the geometry of the objects. Yeah, so this is enough for 19. And this is uh, the one consequence of this in the shadow creation. So 15 is true then. 16, it is not possible to represent a non-manifold mesh using uh, index phase data structure, uh, false. So although we don't like non-manifold meshes, there is nothing that prevents us to represent them uh, uh, with this index phase data structure. Uh, if you recall the non-manifoldness, uh, what's the two-manifold? Uh, your pieces are two-dimensional in 3D. That's why when we are talking about 2D surfaces embedded in 3D, we talk about two manifoldness. Uh, uh, so similarly, when we are talking about one dimensional curves added in two dimensional space, we are talking about one, one manifoldness. So in general, uh, if you are at dimension D, then your manifoldness is D minus one, right? Which is not what I ask here, by the way, but uh, anyway. Uh, for manifoldness, let's go with two manifold. In your surface, you have an edge, and it can be uh, shared by one or two triangles only. Uh, so this is one rule of being manifold. When as soon as you add a third face sharing that uh, edge, then you have a non-manifold uh, mesh in your hands. Uh, but this can be represented with this index phase structure, actually. You can just add that uh, triangle to your system, like all other triangles. So then it is possible. Uh, and again, as far as the manifoldness goes, uh, there is a second condition other than this edge condition. Now, for a given vertex in your mesh, uh, you look at its neighborhood, it should look like a disk or a half disk if you are in, on the border. Uh, yeah, uh, if it is not satisfied, then again, you have a non-manifold mesh. But a, such vertices can still be represented with index phase set data structure. So this makes this number 16 false then. And again, for ma manifoldness, why do we like manifold meshes? as we began speaking about that, let's also remember that. So this is also like the summary of the first term. Uh, so remember the analogy we make with the images. Uh, in images, we have this regularity. For a given pixel, we have four neighbors, up, down, left, right. So, and this regularity makes things easier. We can traverse filters. We can take convolutions. Uh, so why not? import that idea to meshes. 
So if you have a manifold mesh, then you have some regularity. What is that regularity? For a given edge, you know that it will be touching to at most two strands. So this, this makes things a lot easier. Uh, it is a good regularity. Also for the vertices, we have that regularity that we, everything looks like a disk around it. Average vertex degree in a triangle mesh is three. No, it is six as we have derived, driven this using Euler's formula, which was recalled V minus E plus F equal to two. But let, let's not even go there actually, this is intuitive. So you have uh, vertex degree is what? Number of edges coming into that vertex, right? Touching to that vertex. So I have this two pi 360 uh, degree to distribute. So if I use six, uh, if I divide it into six angles, then I will have angles of 60 degrees because 60 times six is uh, 360. And these are the good uh, triangles we expect on a regular triangle mesh. Uh, they will be equilateral triangles with 60 degrees. So that's why it's expected to get six uh, division for a given vertex. And those divider lines, separators are the edges uh, that are giving you the degree, the definition of the degree. So this would have been six instead. So this is the intuitive derivation of this. Uh, again, in the slides, we uh, found uh, this value explicitly using handshaking lemma, starting with this Euler's uh, identity, V minus E plus F equal to two. Uh, so you should also uh, see, see that actually, let's also see that because maybe, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and you miss that later. So now that we are here, but I have to download that actually first. It is from our first week's slides introduction. Uh, yes, in the introduction business, if we uh, look at that at some point I uh, huh, sorry it is not in this set sorry it is in the data structures for graphics week as I discussed triangle meshes as the data as a good data structure for a co computer graphics application so let's go through that set of slides then uh, and here, this is the Euler's formula I was talking about. Uh, number of vertices minus edges plus faces is equal to two for a given closed uh, manifold me mesh planar graph, which is, this is planar because you can magnify a given face like here and project everything here and you have no edge intersections. This applies to the cube as well as to this generic closed watertight uh, two manifold mesh. So we use this to come to this conclusion, average vertex degree equal to six. And it comes from this fact. So given an edge, it is, uh, so if you count the number of triangles, every triangle provides you three edges. So it will uh, give you, 3f as the number of edges, but this actually overcounts. 3f is actually equal to double the number of edges because this edge is counted twice, once from this triangle and once from this triangle. So here I make the conclusion that 2e is equal to 3f. And when I plug uh, 2e over 3 instead of f here, and I set it to zero, so I discard two because these values are way bigger than two number of vertices are like around thousands. So that's why we have the approximations, by the way, this is not equal, but these are all uh, valid approximations. So from here, we conclude that, conclude that number of edges is 
triple the, thrice the number of vertices. Similarly, when you plug this uh, 3f over 2 instead of e here for the same Euler's equation, you have f equal to 2v. And then we combine all this information to get the average vertex degree. So what is the average vertex degree? For a given vertex, I count its degree and I do it for all the vertices. So it will be sum of all degrees. So what will that sum give you is it will give you uh, the number of edges twice because when you take the degree of D, it will count this edge. And later when you take the degree of E, vertex E, it will count this edge again because every edge has two endpoints by definition. So this degree sum is actually going to be equal to two times E, which is actually two times three V, which is six V. And to get the average, I divide all these sums by number of vertices because I take the sums over all the vertices. So then these go away and you have, you end up with six, uh, which would be the answer to that uh, question. Uh, and coming back to the exam paper, rotation is a nonlinear transformation very wrong by definition. Uh, this is an affine transformation. It's linear, uh, just like translation. Uh, it's, so what does it mean? Since it's a linear transformation, all the lines remain line after this transformation, like rotation. When you rotate something, if it is line, it will not be bent or it will not be a curvy shape. It will still be a line. Also, all the parallel lines remain parallel when you apply the rotation to that set. So this is linear. That's why this is false. Uh, fill in the blanks. We did the 19, uh, the difference. In ray tracing, we determine whether a point is under shadow or not by using the secondary ray called shadow ray. And what that ray does is we cast another ray from that point in question towards the light. Uh, if it intersects an object uh, on that path before the light, then it means that light cannot reach that vertex, so it is in shadow. Homogeneous coordinates enable us uh, to represent uh, affine transformations uh, as matrices that can be multiplied together. So we can compose multiple transformations using homogeneous coordinates. In particular, we need that for the translation because with regular coordinates, we cannot represent translation as a matrix times vector, the point vector. Uh, to be able to do that, we add this extra row with one in the end. That would be the homogeneous coordinate for that purpose. Uh, and now we can multiply that uh, point vector with this new matrix. Uh, and we also do this for the other rotation scaling and other transformations as well, because in case we compose hybrids, a hybrid of transformations, we would be needing uh, that. Uh, uh, so we, we would be needing a translation somewhere between. So once we do it for translation, we have to repeat that uh, homogeneous coordinates for all other transformations as well. But what I ask here is like this, compose, the, compose multiple transformations together uh, using matrix multiplication. And the motivation of this is the following. So in an animation, you will be applying a transformation as, uh, that is a set of maybe five transformations. You rotate around z-axis, rotate around y-axis, translate, scale, and rotate around x-axis again. Uh, so five operations, uh, which needs, for every frame of your animation, a given vertex must be exposed to these five multiplications separately. But I 
And remember that I will have like thousands of these vertices around for a given mesh model, like the one uh, behind me actually. So one motivation of using a composition of transformations and saving it as a single matrix is that uh, instead of applying five many transformations to a given vertex, you just compute that matrix m equal to m1 times m2 times m3 times m4 times m5. So you apply that m at every frame, which doesn't change. So just compute it once and apply it. Uh, so that is the main motivation of using uh, matrix multiplication uh, in computer graphics. And homogeneous coordinates essentially enable us to perform the matrix multiplication uh, to compose trans multiple transformations. The main difference between face set structure and index face structure is that, uh, so in the face set version, we just explicitly uh, save the coordinates. So a given triangle will have three, coordin three uh, coordinates and each coordinate has three, actually, so a given triangle will have three vertices and each vertex will have three coordinates, X, Y, Z. So I have nine floating points uh, for a given triangle, which is like inefficient to begin with. And also later on, the same vertex will be used by many triangles, actually. We have just seen that it is the average degree is six. So it will be repeated on average six times. And for so I will repeat that three X, Y, Z coordinate for that vertex all over again, which are all floating point numbers. It takes more space than integer indices. So this is about storage inefficiency of the face set structure. There is also maintenance difficulty like if you deform the model you change the point one vertex for instance from one location to another then you have to update six different locations on average because that point appears on six different places in your structure to remedy these problems we have introduced indexed phase set structure uh, and in that scenario, we just keep uh, the vertices at a different array, or dynamic array, or word vector list, whatever. And for the triangles, we just use integer ad index addresses of the corresponding three vertices. So when you change the position of a vertex, uh, the index of that will be intact, will be unchanged. So nothing happens. You don't have to worry about maintenance issues. Also, we are now using integers and not uh, replicated floating points, which takes, which makes it more efficient. Uh, so redundancy here, your friend is talking about that. Uh, so that reputation is prevented. So, the, so an answer like this will be, will be getting uh, all the points. The output of the marching cubes is uh, a polygonal, a polygon mesh actually, remember, from a cube, actually in particular it's a triangle mesh, from a cube that we march through, we produce one or two or three, some amount of triangles based on the ISO values. So those triangles are touching the same level, like ISO surface uh, zero. That's why you can tell that it's a triangle mesh of an ISO surface. So, uh, but this is not necessary. What I want to see here is Martian cubes provides uh, a mesh to you. And it is actually how we uh, get the explicit mesh from the scalar field that implicitly defines our uh, surface. It is a very nice way of getting that, making that conversion from scalar field to uh, the actual triangle mesh that you can represent with index phase structure. The term AABB stands for, uh, so I thought that this would 
be just basic to collect points, but uh, for funny answers, some of you mentioned A times A times B times B, like matrix multiplications. Of course, it didn't get any points, unfortunately, but the correct way is excellent bounding box. We also have OBB, oriented bounding box. But this is AABB. And this we discussed while talking about modeling transformations. The steps required to reflect a point over an arbitrary plane. So over a well-known plane, like I have XY plane, to reflect it, we already have a matrix for that. It's once in the diagonal and uh, minus one for the coordinate to be reflected. It is a very special case of a scale matrix. So the only trick here is I am not giving you that XY plane. I give you an arbitrary plane, like a very weird plane. So what you have to do is you, uh, and that plane is defined by its normal and the point on that plane. As you know, uh, we define planes. I need two things, a point on the plane as well as the normal. So you have that information already in your hand. Then you will take that point and move it to the origin, which effectively moves your plane to the origin. Then you look at the normal of that plane and rotate that normal so that it, it aligns with the Z axis. So you snap it into uh, XZ plane and then rotate again to snap it to the Z axis only. Now I have a, I am, now my plane uh, is at a, good axis that I know. In this particular example, since normal is aligned with the Z axis, the plane is at the XY plane. The plane is the XY plane for which I know the reflection matrix. Uh, it is one, one minus one, and one for homogeneous, that diagonal matrix. You don't have to give that, but this is that reflection matrix. So reflect over XY plane using that uh, matrix and then undo. Uh, come back to your original location. To do that, you first disoriented, disorient your normal to its original position on the step two. And then remember, I first moved everything so that the that point is on the origin. Now move that point back to its own location. And obviously apply this to all other points. So they will also go to the convenient uh, appropriate locations. And that will be the end of it. Uh, The, uh, and if I recall, I have a very similar uh, question about this in the classical questions below. So we will go there. The implicit formula for a sphere is this. Uh, so what you need is implicit means when you plug your X, Y, Z points into this formula, it will return zero. So what is that formula? Uh, you essentially take the distance between that x, y, z point and the center point, which is given to you. This is how we define a sphere. And that distance must be equal to r for all the points. Because by definition, sphere is defined in such a way that the distance of every surface, sphere surface point to the center is r. Here we are seeing r squares because this is the square, Remember the distance between X and C, there is a square root here. Uh, so this is equal to R. To get rid of the square root, we take the square of this. That's why we are using square of R radius. So that will be the answer actually, as simple as that. Uh, and then comes the classical questions. Again, this is a good answer here. Uh, we are in 2D. And I want you to double the size of a given model, like an apple or orange, whatever. Uh, and you will double it with respect to a fixed point. To do that, you first move your object so that the fixed point will be in the origin. In general, we generally pick this fixed point as the center of the object, uh, but it can be any point. But uh, so let's assume that way, like then your 
Apple is in the origin. Do your scaling in that origin because scaling is defined, uh, is can work if the fixed point is in the origin, zero, zero. Then once you scale it, you move it back uh, to the original location. So it will be this order. Order is also important. First translate using T with minus two and minus seven to cancel out two and seven. Uh, then do the scaling T S. So in other words, you have, you need S times T, which is here, this matrix, then translate back using the positive original uh, translation. Yeah, that is the answer. For rotation, I give you a point to rotate 30 degrees around the axis. So this is not an arbitrary axis. So this is not that difficult. It is also not that trivial because I am not giving you a, an axis that you already know, like the Y axis. Uh, I give you this axis actually, passing through uh, four, five, six, which is like this black dot, X, Y on the floor, Z looking up. And four, nine, six is somewhere here, this black dot. So th that will be this axis, right? It is parallel to Y axis. So all you have to do is move it to the Y axis, then do this y-axis rotation that we know, 30 degrees with 30s, and then move it back to the original location. So if you uh, recall, if you want to see that action, actually uh, we have it here. Uh, so in our... Model, model view transformation slides. Uh, <clears throat> here it is. Uh, here. So you have to open this from secret, apparently. Uh, okay, so this is what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, around arbitrary axis is more tricky. Here, this is the less tricky version. So I give you an axis parallel to a uh, well-known axis, like x-axis in this example. So you move this object and also this axis to on x-axis. So if you apply that transformation, that translation to this object, it will come here. You do the rotation using the well-known x-axis rotation, then undo the first step, come back here. So this is also the reflection question is also about this. So these are all related. Uh, so you need to do some translation, do the rotation and undo the translation with the negated version of the first translation. That's it actually. Uh, here, this is, about the scaling question. Once I am here, let me also show that like fixed point. I want to scale this to this version. So the fixed point here, I move it to the origin, scale it in the origin and then move it back. Actually, these are not that creative questions. These are just regular questions we discussed in the class. Uh, okay, so coming back to the exam then. Uh, with that, so your friend did it correctly. Uh, you use, uh, you move this black point to the origin, which effectively, if you apply this translation to all other points, all this line axis will align with this uh, Y axis. And as well as the, your shape, if it is here, it will like shift here. It doesn't matter where it is in the beginning. Here you do your Y axis rotation, remember, the Y component doesn't change, so it should have been one here. Uh, and here I gave you sinus 30, so you can just plug 0 0.5 here and cosine 30 is equal to sinus 60 actually, as you know from the trigonometry. So I, I expected to put 0 0.8 and one here, uh, 0 0.5 here, and continue with that. 
but here your friend took to difficult path and uh, he just used the square root versions of those values. So after some agony, uh, he managed to get the result, uh, but actually it was enough just to give this stuff as well, but unfortunately not many of you have done that. Um, so translate the origin, do the rotation and undo the translation. So T R and T undo, T U. So T U is the plus four, plus five, plus six version of this. Again, translation matrix, it just becomes in this form <clears throat> that you should have known. <clears throat> and coming to the two, Last two questions where your friend <clears throat> uh, has failed, I think, due to time because uh, anyway. Uh, so here I give you two lines. Actually, this looks a lot uh, of the question we solved uh, in the uh, in class. Mm, so for the ray tracing stuff, after talking about cross products and dot products. I have gave you some applications of dot products and cross products. Here it is, actually I asked this explicitly. Distance between two lines is, uh, you will find this vector V1 to V2, where this vector is perpendicular to both lines to get the minimum distance. And to get that, you use dot product. So this vector that I call X V1 to V2, if you take the scalar projection of it on our vector A, which is from P1 to P2, you get zero. Similarly, it goes for V2 point, uh, same X vector, and now it will use B direction. And those directions are given in the question to you actually. So the problem here is, uh, <clears throat> you have two equations, but three unknowns because we are in 3D. So you have to be go one step further and replace this V1 using the ray equation. Like the beginning, which is 3, 3, 3 in the question, and then T times the direction, which is a unit direction I have given 2 over 3, 2 over 3, 1 over 3. So you just plug this instead of V1 uh, and get this equation. So that this V1 changes with that ray equation. Similarly, this V2 changes with that ray equation with S parameter. This will be using T parameter. So in the end, you will have two unknowns, T and S, and two equations because of two lines. And you can find your S and T. And using S and T, using S, you know your V2. Using T, you know your V1. You can take the distance between V1 and V2 then. I don't expect you to do all the steps, actually. If you give an idea of what is going on, I would have given even full points, but unfortunately, you know, I didn't see much uh, answers about that. Uh, so that is, uh, so this answer is definitely not the answer here. A dot B is the computing the, since these are unit vectors, I think you are tempted to find the uh, angle between them. So that product will give you the cosine of the angle between them, which is not the distance between them. So the, this didn't get any points, unfortunately. And the last question is about Martian cubes. Uh, so given a cell, Martian squares actually, given a square as your cell, I wanted uh, to find the piece that you will extract. So you would have get even uh, partial points if you show that the piece will go from here to here because minus the positive, so some part will be here and minus the positive, another part will be here. So the piece will be a line from here to here. And then the next part is, where is the exact location of this line? So will I just put select the middle point? No. So let me solve this real quick because there is no solution of that. So I can just put this on a PowerPoint and use that pencil there as the final move of this 
exam solving session. So let's go to a PowerPoint and let's uh, get rid of this slide. And remember our, where is my image? Okay, so here it is. If we, uh, so which PowerPoint is being shared? I think this one, yes, this is sh shared. Okay, so here it is. Uh, so, So how to attack this question? So I, I established it. So I, and I am looking for f equal to zero. It is given in the question. So the surplus. I am looking for f equal to zero locations. So it will be closer to this guy because minus two to zero than seven. So it will be somewhere here, uh, and the other piece will be again closer to minus three, a little bit. So that is the piece you will get line. What is this location then, x, y of this point? Again, here f is equal to zero. Okay, f is zero. So if I uh, parameterize this line, u and one minus u, what we get is, uh, so minus two hits the opposite uh, uh, part. So minus two times one minus u, uh, is going to, yeah, so, uh, so I will take this amount of minus two and I will take this amount of seven. So plus, I am doing linear interpolation here, seven amount, U amount of seven. And in the end, the amount I am looking for is zero. Okay, so this equation will give you a u value, which is what in this case, minus plus nine u and minus two. So u is two over nine, I guess, uh, two over nine. Now use this u to go on this ray, just like you have done in your ray tracer. So this is the starting point. It is unfortunately can't be seen at 10. So 10 minus 10 is your origin starting point 10 minus 10 and go plus, go in some direction. This is the direction vector, u amount. What is u? u is two over nine. So what is the direction then? 10 to 40. So I am going from left to right. Okay, left to right. So it will be uh, 40 minus 10 then. 30 is your x component x displacement and your y displacement is the same because I am at the same y value. So your friend made a mistake here. I think this should have been minus 10 because I just moved 30. It is given by the way, 30 is the length of the side. So if you go 30, 10 to 30, 40, okay. And minus 10 is still 10, minus 10. Again, the vertical difference is minus zero. Minus 10, minus, minus 10, zero. So it will be the x, it will be actually where you land here. So this is the x, y I am looking for. So what is that? Uh, so zero addition to the y, so this should be minus 10. And the x should have been 10 plus 60 over nine. So 150 over nine. Yeah, so since these are made up numbers, I couldn't get a good number apparently, but anyway, this can also be simplified to 50 over three, I guess. Uh, yeah, so this is the answer I'm looking for. X, Y is this. And do you do the same logic, put V and one minus V here. And again, use your displacements and get your X, Y here as well. So this is the uh, action you have had to take to get full point from this 
question uh, or even if you give this piece showing that you know it intersects the hybrid edges you will still be getting some points okay so that is the end of the exam questions and their solutions uh, and that is also the end of the session so uh, let's stop recording